So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is, it, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. In Exodus 15, 22 through 25. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, or tree, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Amen. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Minister Josh. Good morning, everybody. I hope you guys are doing well. We are in our third, third week of our expository series in Ruth. And as mentioned before, uh, no PowerPoints. We're just going to look at the Bible. So if you don't have a Bible, I'm going to give you a minute to grab it. Uh, if you have a Bible, but you've not yet turned to Ruth chapter one, would you do that? And then would you also put your finger on Exodus chapter 15? Because we're going to go in between those two texts so that we can best understand Ruth chapter one in our, in our passage for this morning. Before I do that, let me Pray for us. Uh, while I pray, please pray with me uh, as you shuffle to get your Bibles, okay? But my encouragement to you is because this is an expository series, because the highlight of this series is your eyes on the page of the book, I really encourage you to please indeed look at the book, whether it's digitally or physically, would you look at your Bible? And in doing so, I guarantee it'll maximize your understanding and your um, application of God's word into your life, okay? So let me pray for us. Lord Father, we wanna lift up this morning up to you in our third week of this series. Uh, we've been prayfully, hopefully been talking about one overarching theme and that's Jesus, even here in the story of Ruth. Perhaps I should actually say, especially here in the story of Ruth because there's just so much gospel here. So I pray, Lord, that you would uh, yet again do what you have hopefully prayfully done in the weeks past and preach the gospel this morning through this passage. Because what we need, I know what I need more than anything else is good news. What I need more than anything else is the gospel of Jesus. Lord, there are times where I want more strength, more discipline. I want more encouragement. At other times, uh, I, I may be tempted to want more money, more time, more uh, friends, more popularity, more influence, whatever it might be. But Lord, at the end of the day, what we all truly, truly need is Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us Jesus this morning as we devote ourselves to the study of this text. And Lord, on that note, as, as we pray to you, a God who gives, a God who governs, and a God who is good, Lord, we want to pray for the millions of people in Texas this morning who are still without power and water, we want to pray that, Lord, you would protect them and guard them and that you would invigor invigorate them to help one another in this season. We trust that um, you, your sovereignty over the weather has meaning and purpose. It's not out of spite or chaos, but, Lord, it's for something good, for something opportune. And so we do pray that that would be the posture, particularly of the churches and the ministries and the Christians there, Lord, that they would See this as opportunity, not as punishment, not as calamity, Lord. And I pray that you would restore power to communities that need it. Lord, that you would open homes, Lord, for those who are uh, without. Lord, that you would extend friendship, partnership, that you would extend hospitality, Lord, especially in this season for those millions of families, those dozens and thousands of families, Lord, there. Father, we pray this morning also for those uh, recuperating from loss, Lord, we, we pray that you would continue to uh, minister um, as a God who loves resurrection and life, Lord, that you would enter into 
uh, the families in our vicinities, both spiritually and physically, that are uh, reveling and reeling in loss, Lord. And I pray that you would be an encouragement to them. Father, meet us now as we open your word, as our eyes hit the page, as our minds and hearts comprehend the letters and the words. Holy Spirit, would you speak vividly this morning to us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the story of Ruth thus far hopefully has been in general that a man named Elimelech, though his name means God is my king, during perhaps the most tumultuous time of Israel's history, when famine complexes this tumultuous time in Israel's history, decided to bounce, right? So Elimelech, though his name means God is my king, certainly did something that proves that God is obviously not his king. Uh, instead of remaining faithful in the midst of uh, the hardship of the judge's rule and the hardship of famine on top of the judge's rule, Elimelech leaves and he goes to the most backwater, redneck, detestable place that any Israelite can go. And he, he goes to Moab. There, he uh, essentially starts a new life with seemingly no intention to come back. So much so that his two sons, Malon and Kilion, appropriate their father's perspective of where they're at. And instead of holding off to marry uh, so that until they go back to Judah, they marry their in, as in they're settling roots. They're diving deep into Moab, essentially, again, communicating that they have no intention, though Moab has different gods, different a different culture, and they're a different people group. And Israel knows precisely their, and, and, and their hatred against Moab. They had no intention of going back. Uh, by the end of our first sermon in this series, we, we see that Elimelech and Melon and Kilion, we don't know if it's because of this sin, because of the lack of repentance, but we do know that by the end of our first reading, they die. And the only character that is left who is of central concern, at least from an Israelite perspective, is Naomi. And so the story's main character pivots to Naomi, who is with her two daughters-in-law, Ruth, and Orpah. Last week, we talked about how uh, Naomi has a complex theology. She has somewhat of an awareness of God's sovereignty, and I think she has somewhat of a respect for that theology. And so as soon as she hears that the famine has ended, she decides to go back, even though you could say she doesn't have to do that. She does decide to go back, but she goes back with a sort of a, a confused and conflicted theology. Though she knows about God's sovereignty, she doesn't trust in it. And that's why when she decides to go back, she tells uh, Ruth and Orpah not to come with her because her perspective of prosperity, of shalom, as we talked about last week, rest and peace, don't exist in your geographic location or in your submission to God, but more so in having a family and having a, a nice marriage and that Instagram life of a couple of kids in a beautiful house and a nice car and a good job. That's what Naomi's perspective of Shalom was. And so she says, don't follow me. I am uh, the most at risk person in this time period and culture. And so for you to follow me, does it make sense? You're not going to be able to find Shalom. You're not going to be able to find another family and husband, especially as Moabites going to Judah slash Israel. So don't follow me. And Orpah thinks about it and wrestles with it for a while, and she decides not to follow her. But Ruth does something very dramatic, and she clings to her. Because through the course of Ruth's life, perhaps out of her experience losing her husband and her father-in-law, from Ruth's perspective, through the course of these 10 years that the Elimelech and Naomi's family have been in Moab, she has come to not only discover and know about Yahweh, the God of Judah, not the God of Moab, the God of Judah, but she's come to receive and accept and, the, and to believe unto him as her shalom, such that she's able to say at the risk and perhaps cost of my life, I'm going to cling to Naomi and I am going to follow her back to Judah. And that's what she does. And so that's where our story this morning starts is the two women making their way back to Judah. So verse 19, so the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, which is in Judah. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town 
stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? So you can imagine why the whole town is up in an uproar because of Naomi's return. Because for the, from the town's perspective, they're thinking, isn't this Naomi, the wife of Elimelech, who 10 years ago, when things were rough here, peaced out and you completely ditched all of us. And you ditched the God that we all follow and trust in and believe in. So not only were you sort of treasonous, nationally treasonous, but you were also theologically and religiously treasonous. Isn't that, isn't this the same Naomi? Isn't this the Naomi who left with her husband and two boys and were sort of thinking, we're going to Moab and it's going to be better. We're going to start a new life. We're going to adopt a new culture, maybe even believe in some new gods because clearly the God and the culture and the people of Israel, that's, that's not where it's at. I'm going to go find my own and make my own path to success. But now Naomi has come back and she doesn't come back with prosperity. She comes back with very, very heartbreaking, painful poverty. Her husband that she left with, perhaps proudly so, deceased. Her children, which uh, in this culture and time period, that was sort of this symbol of your prosperity as a woman, is your identity as a successful mother. Uh, her children, both of whom also deceased, and she returns with none of these people that she left with, but instead with a daughter-in-law, and that daughter-in-law is a Moabite. So can you imagine the shame, the humiliation that Naomi is feeling as she's coming back? And again, she's coming back because she has an, a theological awareness of God that we'll talk about more in a second. And she can't deny God's sovereignty and God's existence. She's probably heard in her 10 years in Moab. Uh, about the Moabite gods and their system of religion and culture. But for whatever reason, Naomi still does not, uh, doesn't switch and pivot her beliefs. She still believes that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the true God. And so she comes back. But you can see, you can almost hear the hustling and bustling of Bethlehem as Naomi returns, as people are like, this is, that's Naomi. This is crazy. You thought you perhaps were better than us, and yet here you are coming back completely destitute. I, I wish I could come up with a better illustration than this, but I, I hope and pray at least some of you would I, <laughs> will know what I'm saying. It's kind of like when LeBron moved from uh, the Cavs to the Heat, right, and he had that whole press conference. He made this whole big deal about – I'm taking my talents to South Beach. I don't know if you guys remember that. And we soon discovered that he, you know, there's a back channel deals about him moving down there with, uh, with Wade and Chris Bosch. And it's like, what if he went to the heat and they just bombed? They just, they completely lost every single game. And then uh, his whole career was pretty much uh, devastated. And then he came back to the Cavs. It's kind of like, that's how humiliating uh, what Naomi is doing here in verse 19 is. And so it bids the question, Naomi, you have just lost your entire family. Why, why compound on top of the pain of that loss, all this humiliation? Why com compound onto all that pain and suffering, shame, by coming back to your town? In verse 20, she kind of reveals why. She says, she said to the town, to them, do not call me Naomi, which is a name that means pleasant, but call me Mara, which the red translation means bitter. And she says, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. There's so much happening, even in that one little verse, but to really feel the weight of what she's saying there, the theological weight of what she's saying, we have to go to Exodus chapter 15, and we have to just relook at that story that Catherine read for us just a moment ago. In Exodus 15, we find this story of Israel who have just been delivered out of slavery under the Egyptians. They've crossed the Red Sea, and now they're in the Canaanite wilderness, which is pretty much a desert. It's a dry desert, and they're wandering the desert. It says here in verse 22, chapter 15, verse 22, 
They're wandering in the desert for three days and found no water. Mind you, again, we've discussed this. There are at least 1.2 million Hebrews traveling, children, elderly, uh, everybody in between, teenagers, mid-20s and 30s, some singles, some families. You have hundreds of thousands, over a million people traveling in the desert for three whole days without water, without a, a drip of water. And when they came to this place called Mara, which wasn't called Mara, it was just a place where they found water, there was, there was water there, and these 1.2 million people tried to drink that water, but that water was so bitter that even, even the three-day dehydrated 1.2 million Hebrews could not drink it. So this is not a story of teenagers being like, oh, this is not sweet. This is not like that. They're not stuck up. Like th These are people in dire, dire need, and yet the water is so decrepit. The water is so useless, unsalvageable, undrinkable. They call that water Mara, the same name that Naomi appropriates in Ruth chapter 1. And so the people grumble against the Lord. And what, is, what, what does Moses, their covenant mediator, do? Well, he says uh, in verse 25, he cries out to the Lord on behalf of the people. And he takes, he, he, he sees a tree there and he breaks a branch off of the tree, creates a log, and he throws that log into the water. He sees a branch from a tree. He cuts off the branch, so the branch is now cut off, and he throws that branch into the bitterness of the water, and the water becomes sweet and drinkable. Again, the emphasis here I want to place is on how, not just bitter in taste, but clearly Mara means more than flavor, how maybe toxic, maybe destroyed, I don't know, maybe uh, infested, the waters of Mara must have been that over a million Hebrews who have just been traveling in the desert for three days could not drink it. And these are ancient Near Eastern Hebrews. These are not modern day people who are, have higher standards of things. No, I think these are ancient Hebrews and they could not drink it. That's how detestable and bitter the water was. And so if you apply this now to what Naomi is saying in Naomi chapter, in Ruth chapter one, what she is saying is, I am as destitute, as useless, as bitterly broken and unsalvageable and undrinkable as the waters of Mara. That I, even if someone was coming out of the desert in dire poverty and need, I would still be, I would be unusable to them. But more so, because remember, Naomi's object of shalom, her her perspective of rest and peace was in her husband, was in the arms of a husband and children and family. And so when she calls herself Mara, knowing that all the Hebrews in her community would have known the story of Mara and would have grown up with the story of Mara as she did, what she is saying is, I am not only as bitter as those waters, but even more so because I am like Mara without a Moses. There's, there's no hope for me. It's like Mara, that detestable, filthy, disgusting water that is completely unusable without Moses throwing a branch into the water to sweeten it. That's how she sees herself, her predicament. She has gone through so much pain, loss, exploitation. She has felt so abused and abused and broken that she sees herself as Mara without a Moses completely useless, completely unsalvageable. We're not talking about she sees herself as unattractive and beautiful. We're talking about she sees herself as completely destitute and broken. And in fact, when she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, she identify me as Mara. She's not just saying, this is a feeling. She's saying, this is like an existential reality for me now. This is who I am now. I am my brokenness. I am my suffering. I am useless. Not just I feel useless. Not just I feel broken. But I am. 
I am broken. I am useless. There is no hope for me. I am a failure. That's what she's saying. I want to note one major fundamental idea that has two components to it. Although Naomi is deeply, deeply broken because of the loss of her, her spouse, the man she loved, and the children she loved, perhaps even more. Though Naomi is deeply broken and a victim of great suffering, I want you to notice that her suffering does not break her belief in God. It definitely blinds her belief in God. But I want you to notice that her suffering does not break her belief in God. She doesn't say, after all this suffering and loss, she doesn't say, even though she perceives herself as Mara without a Moses, she does not say, therefore, God does not exist. She, in fact, doesn't even change her theology. She doesn't even say, God must not be that good or that in control. Actually, she doesn't believe in God's goodness. That, that, that's true. But she doesn't take away from God what is rightfully his, his sovereignty and his power. Because she literally says right after, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. She says, the Almighty. And I think this is, this is a huge fundamental difference between 21st century postmodern Christians and ancient Near East Hebrews. It, this is the major difference between people who uh, exist following, I think, Enlightenment era, 16th century Enlightenment era, and before that, because most people use the argument of human suffering as the reason to not believe in God. And in fact, most of my non-Christians say, well, what, how do you reconcile evil and suffering in the world along with a good, gracious God? And it's for that reason that they're not Christians. But notice, Naomi doesn't dare walk that line. She doesn't dare get close to that line of, well, because I suffered horribly, miserably, Mara without a Moses kind of suffering. She never says, well, because of that, God is not God or God doesn't exist. Because to her, there is an even greater suffering. There is something that would compound her suffering even more than the amount of suffering she has here and now. And that's if her suffering was a product, not of the almighty God, but out of just chaos. She knows that there is a kind of suffering that would compound her suffering beyond even comprehension, beyond probably the ability to live, and that's if her suffering had no sovereignty. Then, it, then her suffering would be meaningless. It would just be, why did your husband die? Why did your kids die? No, it doesn't matter. Nobody knows. And therefore, what is the point of living then at that point? Why even live if our suffering has no sovereignty? And also notice that she doesn't dare disrespect or um, or remove her reverence from who God is. Because again, she understands that there is a suffering that is even worse than the suffering she's going through now, which is not only, A, if she uses her suffering to disbelieve in God, that makes her suffering even worse because that's suffering without sovereignty and meaning and purpose. But she also knows that if she was to belittle God, maybe she still believes in him, but she belittles God because of her suffering. She knows that there could be even worse suffering after that. And that's exactly why Jesus says, hell is as horrible and filled with as much suffering as it is. Because it is the fullness of God's wrath, not the absence of God's presence. And so hell itself is an eternal, it's eternity of suffering, paying the price for our sin. Because we did not have the faith, or some did not have the faith, to let Jesus pay for it on our behalf. So the first thing I need you to notice is, as you're hearing and you're feeling the weight of brokenness, and you're seeing Naomi identify deeply, existentially, with her brokenness and suffering and loss, 
she does not use that as a reason to either disbelieve in God or belittle God. She's bitter. Yeah, she's bitter. Of course, she has permission to be bitter and destitute and painful, pain-filled. She's suffering, yes, but she doesn't use that to desecrate God or disbelieve in God. And that, I think, is a huge difference between how postmodern 21st century westernized American Christians respond to suffering and how the people in the Bible respond to suffering. But the second thing I want you to notice, though, is that, yeah, she doesn't deny or disbelieve in God, but she does. She is still, as we've seen throughout the entire first chapter, she is still blinded. She's blinded, particularly in two areas. First, when we continue to read in verse 21, she says, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. There's a theology in there that says that acknowledges God's sovereignty, yes, but it's blinded to God's sweetness. She understands God's sovereignty, but she doesn't believe in God's goodness because she thinks that when she left Judah, she thinks when she left Bethlehem, she was full. And she thinks because of the loss of her shalom, earthly shalom, she's come back empty. But the reality is, from God's perspective, Naomi left empty and Naomi came back empty. But her suffering blinds her to that. And you could even go so far as to say her sin in making creation and not the creator the ultimate thing in life. Do idolizing husband, marriage, family, and children as much as Naomi did, that caused her to be blinded to the reality of her actual life because she did not leave Judah full. She left Judah empty with disbelief, distrust in the fullness of the creator of Shalom. And so she comes back empty. But secondly, she's also blinded. And in fact, I love how the writers put this because they put verse 27 in another as a separate paragraph. I love that because it's distinct. It almost shows, it almost visually, literally shows Naomi's blindness. She's blinded to the fact that she wasn't full. You, you didn't have fullness and then lose it. You had emptiness, Try to fill it with family. And then once you lost that, you still remained empty. You're still, you're just as empty as you were before you left. That's the first place and level where she's blind. But the second level is verse 27. When Naomi returns, Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, was with her. And there's such an irony. Okay, listen carefully. Okay, listen carefully. I need you to track here. It's so ironic that Naomi calls herself Mara, bitter waters from Exodus 15, where Moses cut off a branch and threw it in the bitterness and it made it sweet. And here, do we not have a Moabite woman who's been cut off from the Moabites, cut off from her family, completely detached and cut off from her entire family tree and thrown into the bitterness of Mara? And by the end of the story, that act of Ruth clinging to Mara, being thrown into her bitterness, creates sweetness in the heart and life and in the worship and faith of Naomi. And my friends, you and I have the same, if not greater. We have a truer and better log. We have a truer and better Ruth. We have Christ himself, who in Isaiah 58 was said to be cut off from the land of the living. And in fact, when he was crucified, was he not visually cut off from the people of God as his cross was erected, not in Jerusalem where the Jews live, but it was erected outside of Jerusalem. So even visually, Jesus was cut off from the people of God and there in a moment of great cut offness, what does God do but forsake him? He turns his face from him and he cuts him off even from fellowship with the Father so that 
those of you, those of us like Naomi, you and I, lost in bitterness, lost in our suffering, oftentimes so prone to believe that we are unsalvageable, unusable, broken, disgusting, ugly failures, that Christ would be thrown into the mess of our self-hatred, wallowing bitterness to create eternal sweetness, the sweetness of salvation itself. My friends, it is very, very easy for us to let the circumstances around us define not just how we feel, but on a long enough time period to define who we think we are. And some of you, maybe this morning, you may feel like you are your mistakes. You are your brokenness. You are exactly the things that people have said to you, maybe your parents. You feel like, and not just feel, you believe you are just as valuable as the grades you get or the grades you don't get, the number of friends you have or the number of friends you don't have. Some of you actually believe, not just feel, but you believe that you are, as Naomi believed, Mara without a Moses, helpless, completely unusable, unsavable, completely detestable, unattractive. No one will love me. No one will accept me. No one will celebrate me. And hear the good news that as Naomi had Ruth, as the Israelites had that log that was cast into its bitterness, you have something even greater. You have Jesus Christ himself, who on that cross entered into the brokenness and bitterness of all you are, took it away and clothed you with eternal righteousness, the sweetness, the eternal sweetness of salvation. And 2 Corinthians, Paul, for that reason, says that we are the sweet aroma of Christ unto the glory of God. That's who you are. That's who I am. So my friends, I invite you to respond to the good news of Jesus as we sing this song in worship. Will you sing it with belief in your heart? Believe in the gospel and the truths of the gospel more than the temptation to believe that your circumstances, that your past, that your present history defines you. But believe instead that the suffering of Christ is what defines me. The person of Jesus and the work of Jesus is what defines me. Let's worship now.